Okay, we are here, and actually this is my wife's office, and uh, today we're going to talk with uh, a friend of mine named Rick Allen. Uh, Rick is on the screen over here. And the reason for this is because, as all of you know, the NCAA, actually specifically it was the NCAA Division I Council, uh, has uh, had a rule change where they're going to extend eligibility of, of players. And this is going to have an enormous and Rick, by the way, I'm going to ask you some specific questions, but if I screw up anything in this opening monologue, uh, jump in and, and tell me. This is going to have enormous impact on, uh, on all college ball players for the next five years uh, because uh, kids with, that are going in, uh, they may be denied opportunity because uh, all of a sudden that graduating senior uh, I'll give you an example. The, the graduating senior goes, uh, you know, you, you have a dialogue with the coach, and he says, you know, look, you're a shortstop. My shortstop is, uh, is graduating. You're the guy, and all of a sudden you're not the guy. So it's going to impact on a lot of stuff. I, I know it's even going to impact on the draft. It's going to impact on the draft, and we're going to have a discussion with the Red Sox scout. We're going to have a discussion with several – uh, college coaches. So, uh, Rick, what can you tell me? Can you, in a nutshell, tell me and, and everybody listening what this is about? So, uh, Carl, of course, with the cancellation of uh, spring, uh, the spring baseball season and all spring college sports, um, you know, athletes have been granted uh, another year of eligibility by NCAA at all levels, uh, Division One, Division Two. If they were in their senior year, at certain levels, even if they were younger than senior year, they're now allowed an additional year. And so, as you mentioned, it's going to create a logjam on baseball rosters and other sports because um, seniors who were in their last year of eligibility um, at many schools are going to be given an opportunity to return. Um, furthermore, if they're able to still be on scholarship, that won't count against their team's scholarship limit. You're going to have juniors who might have otherwise been drafted this year who may be returning next year. And, and you're going to have the highly recruited, highly touted incoming uh, freshman athletes who might have otherwise been drafted this year may not be drafted. So as you mentioned, it's going to create a real log jam uh, in terms of uh, baseball rosters in the future, as well as other spring sports. Well, as you're talking, I came up with uh, a whole bunch of, of questions. Number one, I want to emphasize that uh, we're not just addressing baseball. Baseball happens to be in my area baseball and track to some degree happen to be my areas of personal specialization in the moment, but we want to open these up for comments on others. And by the way, we're going to invite people to, it's not our first uh, session with Rick, we're going to have him available for questioning and, ev and everything, but correct me if I'm wrong, baseball is particularly effective because it's a roster uh, game. It's influenced by numbers. So, uh, Division I baseball is the only uh, college sport, only NCAA sport, or at any college level that I'm aware of, where they're limited uh, by rule by the number of athletes they can have on their roster during the regular season. Can I interrupt so, you? Are they, is there any discussion? Um, I'm going to hang on a, a friend of mine named Dan Gooley, who used to be the head coach of Quinnipiac. And I understood, I'm, I may need to be corrected here, but I understand that, is there any discussion to expand rosters uh, to accommodate this? So Carl, at this time, what NCAA Division I has done is for, again, for those who were 
were seniors this year or in their, in their last year of eligibility, players who were in their last year of eligibility at the Division I level, if they return next year, they will not count as a roster slot for Division I rosters. But any other player returning, uh, a younger player returning to the roster next year, a high school incoming recruit, a junior college transfer, they're all going to count as a regular roster slot. So basically, you've got the Division I rule limiting to 35 men on the roster during the spring, and then it can be expanded only by the number of guys who were seniors this year and choose to return. So – Doing the math, what that means specifically is, let's say I have two seniors that we're going to afford that opportunity, correct? Yep. Okay, so now my roster is at 37. Let's take that a step further. Let's say, and I know this isn't real common at the Division I level, let's say there were seven seniors on the roster four of them choose to return. The other three are going to move on to their business career, whatever they choose to do. But four of those return. Now you're going to have 39 on that roster next year. All right. Correct me if I'm wrong again, but it's my understanding. Uh, Again, I'm, I'm interjecting some of my conversations leading into this interview with you, but uh, the coach that I'm speaking to, his name is Dan uh, Gooley, and he was talking to Jim Penders, who is the head coach at Connecticut, and he says this is going to be a lot of tough choices for the coaches because, correct me if I'm wrong, that year of eligibility is the coach's choice. Am I correct? In other words... Let's say that there's a scholarship player. The coach, am I correct in saying the coach does not, especially since scholar, I don't know if people understand that scholarships are not, it's not a four-year deal, it's renewed anyway. So that coach ha, you know, has to make a choice on that player. Is that correct? Definitely, that's correct. And, and even in situations where, such as uh, in the major conferences, like the ACC or SEC. Um, under normal circumstances, those scholarships are to be renewed automatically at the same level. But in this situation, again, for seniors, um, because of uh, budgetary limits and so forth, if those guys return, they don't necessarily have to be um, – on the same scholarship level. And in fact, the coach could say, you're welcome to return. I don't have a scholarship for you next year. Right. Okay. So, uh, boy, a lot of really uh, tough, uh, tough choices. And something that I don't see a lot of discussion about, but is definitely a factor in this, is the finances, is the revenue is that at an individual school, there is a loss of revenue for all these spring sports. And God help us if, if this impacts football. Holy mackerel. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a very big deal. I, I hate to say this, but it could impact on, on, on colleges even uh, doing away with, with programs because they won't be able to uh, – they won't be able to afford them. I, I don't remember, yes they do. It was Urbana College in Ohio that uh, there was a kid on the internet last night and he was set to go to Urbana, which I believe is a division two school, and they closed the school down. Yep. They closed the school down. Yep. And so that's one example. Another example is uh, St. Edwards down in Texas actually uh, is dropping not baseball, and I know, Carl, your primary interest is baseball, no, we can talk uh, about but, but St. Edwards is dropping uh, men's and women's uh, golf, uh, men's and women's tennis, if I remember correctly, and soccer. 
And the soccer one was a little bit surprising because, um, you know, the majority of those athletes, they're, they're on a – and it's true in baseball too. The majority of those athletes are probably on at the Division II level for sure are receiving less than a 50% scholarship value. So they actually bring in more money in tuition and room and board and so forth to the university than the university spends on them. But still, uh, they even uh, they even chose to drop that sport because of the budget impact. Boy, uh, you know, you and I have had a lot of discussions over the years about this. Um, I'm not, I don't want to call anybody out. And there are people I do want to call out. I don't want to make a broad generality, but I think that sometimes with the current industry model, with uh, the instruction, uh, I heard a great word for it, that turnification, like there's a certification that comes from, you know, going to these tournaments and showcases and everything. There is uh, almost uh, uh, the imprint of a fantasy that this is something easy to do. And it's not. The, the numbers are really, really difficult. 90, uh, let's see, what is it? 93% of high school seniors do not play in college. Uh, it goes all the way to 94 if it's, uh, if it's NCAA. Not, you know, 7% uh, play if you include NAIA schools. So, you know, this in a, in a good time without this is something that parents have and, and players really have to pay attention to what is being said to them and what the truth is about the opportunities that they're being afforded. And boy, more than ever now, don't you agree? Definitely, uh, definitely agree with that. And, and I know I've told you this before, uh, you know, through our service informed athlete, a lot of our uh, consultations and talks we have with clients uh, over the years have been about transfer situations. I, things aren't, for whatever reason, things aren't working out at my current school. I need to transfer. Can I, 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 can I interrupt you there? Uh, going back, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know now. I haven't kept abreast of it that much. But the, Three years ago, I was working with several clients, and I heard that the biggest migration in college baseball was down. In other words, they were, you know, D1 kids were not being given the playing opportunities that they thought they would have, so they were going down to Division II. And, and my point, as you and I have talked about privately so many times, is a lot of this comes from misinformation and emotional decisions and uh, not being realistic about the opportunities they're going to get at a particular place. So they end up transferring. That's what I was getting ready to say is I feel that a lot of those uh, transfer situations could have been avoided possibly if the athletes and the parents had asked more questions, been more you know, open to considering other options, uh, when they made their initial choice coming out of high school, you know, going to a school that is maybe a more appropriate fit for them rather than uh, shooting for their dream school where, yeah, I'd love to be at this school, but is it a good fit for you? Right. And one of the major factors uh, is that very few people are told to take into consideration development. If I go into a school, let's say I go to a division at any level, at 18 years old, I'm competing with players that are 22, even 23, that have been competing at that level for four years already, three, four years already. And, you know, nobody's going to sit back and say, yeah, here's, here's my job, take my job, go ahead. And then, of course, this is all on top of all the other factors is, is your, you know, are you going to get a good education there? Is it something you can afford? Is it uh, socially attractive to you? Is it geographically compatible with where you want to be? 
And uh, can I ask you, do you have any idea what the percentage of that is in your business that you advise people what the percentage of transfers is? Uh, you mean the percentage of our business that is transfers compared to eligibility and so forth? Yes, people are oh, specifically about transfer situations. Oh, it's definitely pro over 50%, probably wow. like 60 or 70%. Wow. See, that's what we're trying to do with our businesses. We're trying, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, you use the term informed athlete. That's the name of your company. And that's what we're trying to, to do too. The majority of our business, same thing, people... Uh, I would say that half of ours are people that are transferred, they have problems at the school, that they're not getting playing time, they're unhappy with the environment, whatever it is. And uh, the second thing is that, uh, and I, uh, is that people come out of high school and, and they don't have realistic expectations about where they're going. They, you, you hit the nail on that with a sledgehammer, they're follow, following their dreams. Uh, not uh, not reality, and that re and that reality, you know, it's it's interesting. I, in my experience, and I know you're not a skills guy, but in my experience, I've actually never had a kid come to me that I said, "You can't play college baseball." I've said you need to adjust your dreams, and you need to find an appropriate place for you. But I yet, I've never had a kid, not, um, and I've had all sorts of kids come through our system, kids that, um, geez, I had one kid that pitched a total of four innings in four years of high school. I told him to take a gap year and get better, and he ended up getting a full scholarship. You know, I had another kid that uh, played a total in four years of high school, played a total of two innings. Went to a went to a, a school and got and by his sophomore year he started. So you know if 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 you that, and that shows you something else. It's really so much of it is here, and here it is that player. If you give a chance, you get it into an environment where you can succeed and put your passion to work, you can be successful. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, so all this goes to. Uh, and I, I know what we're doing. Are you telling your clients to basically, I'm, I'm putting stuff up on the internet and everything. I'm saying, boy, <laughs> more than ever, you got to hunker down right now. You really have got to pay attention to the decisions you're making and, uh, make, be well informed, put your, make your emotions part of it, but make good decisions. Right. And, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the thing about the current environment is things may be a little uncomfortable uh, for the athlete where they currently are for whatever the reasons are, but in the current environment, transferring to the unknown could potentially be worse than what the known situation is. That's the difficult part about this. Uh, is that, yeah, you may, you may have a scholarship and you may be getting a little bit of playing time at your current school. You don't know for sure what's going to happen at the new school over here. Well, that leads me to a, a whole other kettle of fish, uh, which I'm going to go over with um, specifically with the college coach because a lot of times – these kids go to tryouts, uh, they go to camps, they go to showcases, they go to tournaments, and um, number one, they have to realize, I don't know of any of those events where a head coach is at. Uh, to be honest with you, the vast majority of those, there are assistant coaches that are administrating those things. And, and uh, to be really blunt, uh, let's use let's use 95 miles an hour as a as a uh, as a discussion point, okay? Sure. My, when let's say that I've got I'm an NCAA Division One program, but I've only got four scholarships. My job is to go to these camps and get 
10 guys <laughs> that throw 97 miles an hour committed to my to my school and uh that, scholarships. yes that, that exactly uh exactly right that's uh you know i've had i had a kid uh, that i've got right now and he um he gives uh his dad says to me uh 30 schools are following my son i said you mean i'm going to go to one of his high school games this year and there's going to be 30 guys out there with clipboards and radar guns you know it's just it's just data based uh he went to a uh he went to a uh um he went to one showcase and he got all excited because one of the coaches came up and said love your slider I said, boy, that's great, except he doesn't throw one. <laughs> and people don't, you know, what's, uh, people don't realize how much, and I understand, look at your child. Uh, you want nothing more for him than to succeed and fulfill that dream and that passion. Yes. And, and when people tell you those things, boy, those are hot buttons to push. And people just get crazy and they make decisions over about, you know, on that kind of information rather than really they need to learn how to ask blunt questions and get direct answers. And you mentioned that, you know, at a lot of those showcases and camps, it's not the head coaches that are there. And one bit of information uh, when I'm talking to high school athletes or parents of high school athletes, which is not the majority of our business. But uh, when I'm talking to those families, uh, my key bit of advice is do whatever you can to try to spend a little bit of time with the head coach and make sure that it feels like there's some, some kind of a good connection or chemistry with the head coach. Because if you're being recruited by the pitching coach or the hitting coach, right. there's a strong likelihood that coach may not be at that school in a year or two. And so you need to know that the head coach has got your back and is invested in you. If the head coach was simply taking the advice of the uh, pitching coach or the hitting coach, and now that coach has left for another school, you're not in a good position. One of the things that, uh, and again, we're, I, I'm very sincerely, I know that this is not going to be the only one of these we do. But when kids come to me, one of the first questions I ask, the first question I ask, I say, uh, you do know that this is five or six hours a day. It's not like high school. This is not an hour and a half of practice uh, after school and you take 10 swings and go in the outfield and tell jokes with your buddies. This is really serious, and if you really want to be good, in addition to that five or six hours, you're going to put in another two on your own and working specifically on, uh, on your own game. The second thing I ask them, I say, okay, I'm a coach. What do you, what do you say to me? And they always say, uh, I'd really like to play for you. And I said, you, you're wrong already. You've got to understand that you're interviewing them not vice versa. You're, you're trying to see very specifically what kind of opportunities you're going to be afforded to play and to and get better and develop. You know, uh, very easy to get lost in these, uh, these, these programs. Even, even if you do well going in, you know, they recruit, you know what I'm saying, they recruit, it's, it's numbers. And it becomes very, very difficult. You need a real honest look at what you're going into when you, when you do that. Oh, yeah. And whether it's, a, whether it's a transfer. Now, last question for today. Actually, uh, I have two more. But I've got, I actually talked to you about this previously. If you have a kid that's not getting any love from, a D1, from the D1 school, he's got his heart set on D1. And, you know, I'm going to use an easy barometer. He's throwing 82, 83. And the kid I'm talking about is a, is, a, is a kid that just because of his own personal physical development 
you can project, I can project that he has a good shot to get the 90 by 80s, 90 in a year or two. He just had a growth spurt. He's learning how to, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. There is going to be some development, but he probably will, his personal development will not fit with what they are looking at. They're looking at kids right now. He's a junior, so they're looking at kids right, he's here, and they're looking at kids that are already throwing 87, 89. Right. Now, now and I've told him, uh, there's nothing wrong in, it's better to go someplace and play. You know, uh, I said, you, you know, you can also, and I want you to talk about it, you can transfer up. If you're, uh, in fact, the classic one about this is Tom Seaver. Tom Seaver started at, uh, I can't remember, one of the community colleges in the Los Angeles area. Didn't even make his high school team until he was a senior. And then, uh, I can't remember where, he went to a community college in the Los Angeles area and then not, ended up at UCLA. Because, you know, uh, that was his developmental curve. So you can, if you go, it, you know, just because you don't get that D1 scholarship you're looking for, there's nothing wrong with going someplace and starting out and playing and developing. Right. Uh, you know, the junior college route or the prep school route, uh, a post-grad year, there's a number of, a number of options out there. I want to interrupt you, right? You know what? In all the years we've been doing this, and we have never been unsuccessful. If you get a kid that'll listen to you, we're always successful. And you know what has worked 100% of the time is a gap year. You know, the, the kid that pitched four innings in high school and you got a full scholarship for him, I told him, I said, your best bet is to take a year off and work out and get better, take some classes at a, you know, get, get your gen ed stuff done at a, at a local school and, and then go into the market again. Yeah, uh, it's a definite option that athletes uh, can uh, consider. Uh, they just need to make sure, I'll just add, uh, they need to make sure that if they're taking a couple of classes, as you mentioned, that they're only enrolled part-time so they don't start their college eligibility clock. Well, you know, this is why we know each other for a few years, because I, I, I don't know the details, and that's, that's why I call you. That's why it's not just a matter of having a strength and conditioning coach and a skills coach. This is a business. It's a business at the college and professional level. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely a business. And you need advice about it's it's you know, you're you're hearing the dream. People are feeding your your wish list. Right. And if you make decisions, uh, and I'm all for that. I'm all for dreams, but they need to be tempered with a roadmap and uh, and reality. And it goes not only to things that I give them, but okay, I'm going to show you how to throw fast harder and I'm going to get better and all that stuff and get an applicable skill level. But you need to talk to somebody about your grades and the eligibility rules and how you're going to do that. You know, you're right. Somebody takes a gap year, but they, you know, they lose a year of eligibility. So those things are all imperative. Right. Absolutely. All right, so uh, I, I'm sorry to all of our clients out there if we painted a bleak picture. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's bleak, it just is reality. Don't you agree? Oh, it's just an unfortunate, you know, time. Uh, obviously, it's challenging for everybody. Uh, as we've talked about, it's going to create a log jam on rosters for spring sports, and it may take some time to kind of shake out and even out a little bit, get back to what we used to think of as normal. Actually, to tell you the truth, um, and I, I actually think that some good can come out of this. I think that if this forces people to make those better decisions, you're telling me and our audience that 50% of your clients are transfers that haven't made good decisions. 
And if if we if this time, this horrible, uncomfortable time, can force people to pay a little more attention to the details of what they're doing, maybe it's a good thing. It certainly uh, can be be a positive for many people. Uh, you know, yes, some people aren't making the best decisions. And then on the other hand, I'll just add, of course, a lot of times there's a coaching change. And then, you know, new coach wants to bring in their own uh, kids. And so that's another key factor. But again, this is a very challenging time that we're in. And families and athletes are just going to have to be more cautious and more careful about the things they're taking into consideration. I mean, think of, we'll end on, on this note and then we'll do this uh, some more. I had a kid in pro ball. I had a kid in, uh, in short season A. And there was new ownership in the whole system. Oh, okay. And, and he led the team in hitting in short season A. And the next year, a week into spring training, released. Because they want their guys. Right, right. Okay? Uh, you know, think about this poor kid. I put, I responded and said, think about this poor, poor kid who's going to go to Urbana. And the worst thing he can do right now is get panicked and scramble around and try to find an instant fix to that. He needs to entirely regroup and make good, make good choices. Yes. Yep. All right. Well, as always, uh, we love working with you because we love giving people good information. And uh, I, we're going to open this up to some questions. So hopefully we're back with some more stuff with you. Sounds great. Appreciate the opportunity to join you, Carl. Oh, no. Uh, by the way, you can get a hold of Rick through us. Uh, his business is Informed Athlete. He lives in the great state of Minnesota. Wisconsin. I'm sorry. Madison. Which I went to school, where I went to school. So uh, uh, we will be back. We'll open this up with some questions and we'll reschedule. All right? Sounds good. You take right. care. Thanks, Rick.